So tell me, so actually you were a young Carol Bryant back in, in those days. Tell me I about was. Carol Bryant and, and how things were like growing up and how you got involved in sport. I, I got involved in sport, I guess, as, uh, primarily as, as rehab, um, starting with swimming and then a physiotherapist at Great Ormond Street, which was my hospital at that time, uh, said to me, well, I think there's something going on at Stoke Mandeville. Why don't you go down and, and have a look? So uh, my mum and I traipsed off to have a look at what was the national games at that point in time. And, and, and that was it, hooked for life. So you must have met the great man, the father of the uh, and founder of the Paralympic movement, Ludwig Gutmann. Tell us about that. He, yes, I did, of course, and and I knew him uh, for a number of years. Uh, he was he was amazing because he was so dynamic. He was only five foot two, so he was tiny, but you 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 never thought of him as being small because he had such a an enormous personality. He was a complete dictator. So what he said went, but absolutely nothing, nothing stood in the way. It didn't matter if it was the health service, uh, the government, <laughs> overseas nations, whatever he wanted and thought was best, he would take on and push. Amazing man. Brilliant, brilliant. So how was Tokyo, I mean, how was that first experience for you? That, you know, had you ever been abroad before? What, what was that like? I, uh, I was actually a late replacement for an athlete that went sick. So I only had a fortnight's notice that I was going to Tokyo. I had, so I wasn't up to full speed with training, um, nor was I, I prepared in any way, shape or form. But I mean, really, all I wanted to do was compete and to wear a, uh, a, a Great Britain tracksuit was just, it, well, it's never gone away. It fills me with pride. That's brilliant. But so, so that, that journey, how was the kind of the, you know, the aircraft em, embarkation, disembarkation, the, you know, the accommodation, how, did, how was all that then? I think we did have a catering truck that we could, they could use to shove us in from the side. But Like a but forklift. Mostly, kind of, yes, that's yeah. right. Um, but, uh, but, Mostly, our uh, our escorts carried us up the stairs into the plane, and then we were we were extremely lucky with the with the first games really because we used the Olympic Village for accommodation, and we stayed in bungalows, so much easier to adapt. And uh, they, they ramped them. It wasn't ideal. Wouldn't have passed the Disability Discrimination Act nowadays, but we didn't know anything better. And to us, it was phenomenal. Uh, uh, we even used some of the Olympic venues. I mean, none of that happened again for a very long time. You've, you know, competed over multiple games and seen things, and also competed in multiple sports. But I think that was kind of necessary initially, wasn't it, in the in the team? Yeah, it was compulsory because there was there was not much money. Um, there was certainly no government money or sponsors because we weren't well enough known. The, I mean, the public thought that the Paralympics were either an, an umbrella or some sort of exotic bird, I think, uh, but certainly nothing serious. So there wasn't enough money to send uh, sports specialists. You had to do two, three, even four sports when you went to a Games because Otherwise, you just wouldn't get picked. There wasn't the money there to take too many athletes. If you think back, it's actually 50 years since the Lord Alf Morris introduced the uh, Chronically Sick and Disabled Persons Act. But how have you seen uh, life for someone with a disability change over those uh, 50 years since that time? We're not there yet. I, um, I, I think there are still attitudes out there. It's, it's still... A work in progress mm. but nowadays if you're born disabled or become disabled it's much le easier to be accepted back into society and I think that the games have played a role in that and I think it's it's one of their remits in fact that 
it, it's, it's Popper, Popper always said that one of his aims was through sport to get disabled people back into society. Yeah. I, I think it's, it's, he's succeeded out of all recognition. The games now are a, a, a true headliner and people are accepted as athletes and not, the, people forget the disability just as it should be. Well, that's the BPA you know, vision, isn't it? Through sport to inspire a better world for disabled people. And I think, yes. uh, but London 2012, I think played a big part in that. What was your experience of that? Uh, well, I'm biased, of course, because it was, it was a home games, but I truly think it was something special. Uh, I think it was the first time that the public actually came and saw the athlete and the performance rather than the disability uh, and, and it just makes such a huge difference to athletes to to perform in front of packed stands um, because we're all actors really aren't we and yeah. I think you know just that it just lifts you uh, and I think London took the Paralympics to its heart I think Channel 4 played a huge part as well in the way that they presented the games and have continued to do so. It had a different slant. Uh, and I think the med getting the media on board made a, a big difference. I think, do you know what made me feel that we really had arrived was that fencing did not have a good games in London, sadly. Uh, and we got slated in the papers the day after the competition. And that, it, it, it annoyed me to start with. And then I thought, well, Actually, that's equality. But one of the things that you're still doing is helping Tokyo 2020, you know, look at disability and the adaptation. And, I, and I've seen this great photo of you getting into one of the accessible taxis for Tokyo and you've been helping them talk about accommodation. So, I mean, that must yeah. be a great thing to be involved with. Uh, it is. It, 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 it's, uh, it's a privilege, actually, to be able to put some stuff back and, and hopefully make a difference. Uh, I, I, it's, it's a challenge every time there's a games because obviously disability is looked at in different ways across the world with different cultures. Uh, and the Western countries are fairly uniform, I guess now in the way that they treat disabled people, but that, that isn't worldwide. And I think one of the legacies of the games can be to change people's attitudes and again to to get disabled people back into society. And and I, I very much hope that that's something that will continue, not just with Tokyo, because Japan is not uh, a backwards country and the people are extremely welcoming and kind. But, um, in the, in the public sector, I think there are changes that could and will be made to, to improve independence for disabled people. I think it's a great legacy of your life as well, that you've been there at the beginning, winning medals, starting to get the, the presence of uh, Paralympic sport uh, within the media. Now you're there giving back and changing society yourself. So Kaz, I, I want to thank you for this chat. It's been absolutely brilliant to catch up with you. And uh, I'm looking forward to working with you in Tokyo uh, next year. Thanks so much.